Good afternoon, guys. We always talk about the importance of balance. We always talk about the importance of stability. Are they the same thing? Well, the answer to that question is no. However, the outcome of achieving balance and stability within the body is to help facilitate health. Now we should consider our hormonal status as a cyclical status and that cycle lasts 24 hours, night and day. So anabolic processes predominate at the night time why is that? Because you need to grow, you need to repair, and you need to prepare yourself for the upcoming day. Catabolic processes predominate in the day. Fight or flight. You're supposed to be hunting and gathering and uh, using that energy that you stored up overnight. When we talk about the digestive system, there's lots of evidence suggest you should be eating in a time restricted period. Personally, I'm a fan of 16 8, so fasting for 16 hours and eating for 8 hours. It's important to make sure that you do have all of your calories within the eight hours because this is not a starvation diet it's just a different way of thinking about nutrition if you think about the day the start to the day one of your primary drives or incentives should be to go and get food so you're activating your sympathetic nervous system fight or flight if you achieve satiety at eight o'clock, because obviously breakfast is the most important meal of the day, <sighs> old thinking, then you're going to lose a drive. I've certainly found that during the morning, I'm far more alert than I was when I had the most important meal of the day, <sighs> breakfast. So I've, I've found very positive benefits from fasting 16-8. Does it work for everybody? No. Why? Because we're all unique. We're not special, we're unique. Um, and my physiological needs and requirements are likely to be very different from yours. The body shares many similarities. Hopefully we've got both we've all got 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, but the genes are different and how they are expressed is different. So you cannot have a one size fits all philosophy. Principles, 100 percent Rules, not so good. You should never have rules. Law exists because people are plonkers and the law has to appeal to the commonest denominator, the lowest denominator, because people are stupid. Look at the trouble we've got ourselves into. Our egos, my word, choosing the path of least resistance for the maximum reward, not realising that we should be trying to earn that reward. We are our own worst enemies at times and we often listen to the wrong people because uh, what some people offer is something that seems very seductive. But unless you understand the rationalisation for trying to achieve stability and balance within the body, then you can be lured into something that is actually false. False profits everywhere. 
So when it comes to hormones, we are trying to achieve both balance and stability, but they do not coexist in the entirety because, as we've already said, anabolic processes predominate at nighttime and catabolic processes predominate in the daytime. Now, I'm a massive proponent of daily injections, and the reason for that is you can actually achieve stability. But what about SHBG? Because you don't theoretically have to inject every day because you have a normal stroke high SHBG. But my guys that have changed over from day from less sparse injection frequencies to dailies with normal SHBGs have noticed a qualitative difference. It's fascinating really. A small daily dose now, as already discussed, we know that there's diurnal variation. By the very nature of injecting, you are going to cause a peak and a very slight trough, irrespective of the fact that the testosterone ester has to go to the liver to be cleaved to release the testosterone molecule. So, the cyclical nature of hormones is 24 hours so it makes perfect sense to inject daily why don't i feel very good um, it's normally because your injection frequency is incorrect your trough levels can on paper look perfect but the fact is, if you're not injecting daily, you will have a more significant peak and trough. Now, it obviously depends on the length of the ester and the SHBG. But gold standard, daily injections, guys. So, stability, balance. All we're really trying to do is mimic your natural physiology. We're not chasing a number, an absolute. I know what sort of reference range I want you guys in. I want you in that reference range because historically, I know that you will feel best within that reference range. It isn't chasing a total testosterone level it isn't even chasing a free testosterone level. It's chasing a nice ratio of free testosterone to estrogen to dihydrotestosterone. It's actually even more complicated than that because you can have a nice ratio of those three bioavailable androgens and still not be particularly healthy. Now, why is that? Because we're trying to chase a nice ratio of bioavailable androgens. It comes down to SHBG again. This glycoprotein that confuses a lot of people. On the faces of it, face of it, you don't want a high SHBG because. In theory, it's reducing your bioavailable androgen levels. Now, we know that if you increase your bioavailable androgen levels, your qualitative symptoms will improve. But when we think about testosterone replacement therapy, it isn't all about feeling great. Feeling great is incredibly important, but it's not all about feeling great. It's about sustainable changes, long-term physical and psychological well-being. Now just consider some of the low SHBG states. Metabolic syndrome, hypothyroidism, diabetes. These are not healthy states. 
So what do we do? It's interesting, isn't it? Because if you think about testosterone replacement therapy, and if you think about it in simplistic terms, and you only think about it as in the fact that you want to have a nice ratio of testosterone to estrogen to DHT, not recognising that the other physiological parameters within the body also need to be normalised. So what we find with good TRT protocols is, especially with the low SHBG guys, is they, they seem to see an improvement in SHBG. It seems like a slight paradox, doesn't it? We want to lower SHBG to improve our bioavailable bio androgen levels and higher SHBG numbers are associated with less activity, less feeling of well-being. But we need to appreciate that you need to take into consideration absolutely everything. So a sign of a good TRT protocol in somebody with low SHBG is actually a slight increase. So what does that mean? It means that actually the SHBG can fulfill its primary role and that's to act as a buffer. A buffer within the body. We want all systems firing on all cylinders. And SHBG is a glycoprotein produced by the liver that actually serves an important function. Outside of holding on to that precious free testosterone so you can't feel as good and be as active as you want to be, it's also raised in states like hyperthyroidism and inflammatory states such as liver dysfunction and boozers. So it's trying to maintain a constant environment. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the SHBG historically with age does increase as your total testosterone decreases. Now, if you think about natural aging, are you supposed to be as active and as virile as you are when you are 60 than you were when you were, eight, when you were 20? And the answer to that question is no. But does that mean you should deliberately lower your SHBG? The answer to that question is obviously no, because you need to consider the other functions of SHBG. It's poorly understood, but it all comes down to this same discussion, stability and balance. Guys feel worse oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down than they would if they were actually just quite low. So with natural aging, what should happen? Your testosterone should go down, so you should have lower free testosterone, estrogen and dihydrotestosterone. Because you were supposed to die. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but seriously, it's um, people feel better with actually a, a, a better ratio of testosterone estrogen and DHT than oscillating up and down, people manipulating certain hormones to their advantage. You're not supposed to feel terrible as you get older, but you're not supposed to be quite as active and as virile as you are when you're 20, when you're supposed to pass on your DNA. So it's just pure biology, really. But oscillations in your male androgen levels through improper injection frequencies, using the blends, um, not appreciating that despite our best efforts, we seem to have a propensity to aromatization, which is the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And we should be controlling estrogen, not blocking estrogen, to make that ratio correct. 
because the slight distortion in that ratio can be the difference between you feeling great and you feeling pretty rubbish. And it doesn't actually have to be a massive distortion. Some guys can have massively high estrogens and not feel any different. It's quite peculiar, it's very individual, and that's one of the things about medicine. You should never speak in closed statements and never apply a one-size-fits-all model to what is an individual. It's one of the commonest issues, and it's one of the weirdest things in endocrinology because male hormone replacement therapy and female hormone replacement therapy the same standards are applied. It is a one-size-fits-all model. In no, in no other hormonal uh, field does, does that apply. Thyroid, diabetes, etc. It just, it just, it, so I don't know why that standard applies to male and female HRT. So, you could get to the argument and say, well, actually... Since I don't feel uh, bad with a high estrogen, why should I control it? It's a very valid argument, but would you apply the same standard to blood pressure when you know that elevated blood pressure is asymptomatic typically? And it's only when you have the negative consequences of a persistently elevated blood pressure for a number of years that you realise perhaps we should have controlled that blood pressure. Can you apply the same rationale? I don't know. But what we do know about the body is that the body thrives on balance and stability. So, I would actually say yes. I think you should apply that standard. Estrogen's a funny one because there are there are many health benefits from having a normal estrogen. The problem that we have in the TRT community is. Um, People always speak in closed statements. Always have an AI, never have an AI. An aromatase inhibitor should only be prescribed if your prescribing clinician thinks it's appropriate. Your doctor should be able to give you a rationale for why he is prescribing it or why he's not going to prescribe it. I get very confused. I do not understand why people use anastrozole. I find that very peculiar. It's much like tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a proliferation antagonist. Um, so whilst your estrogen numbers may be normal, you're not going to have the benefits of a healthy estrogen level because the tamoxifen is blocking them. So it doesn't make sense. And astrazole is the same thing, competitively binding. I just don't get it. So why do people not use examastain, which is a suicidal inhibitor? Is it because people are confused about the word suicide? So... If you think about the physiological processes in, involved in the HPG axis, and we have a propensity to excess aromatization, surely it would make sense that you kill a small proportion of the aromatase enzyme and look to reverse your propensity to aromatization. So we microdose examastain. Because you do not want to crash your estrogen. Estrogen is incredibly important for cardiovascular health, bone strength, spermatogenesis, all the, lo, lo, mood, lo, loads of things. 
because we are trying to achieve balance and stability. But if something is disrupting that balance and our poisonous environment, our bad habits are disrupting this balance, then it seems logical to redress this and look to balance your testosterone to estrogen to DHT and hopefully see uh, your SHBG come within range. Logical and methodical common sense medicine seems sensible to me.